and welcome back to Real Talk with Encoda. I'm your host, India Wilson. Today, I will be interviewing Walden Angelos. He's a top music producer and musician. Walden, can you um, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm originally from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I relocated to Los Angeles in the mid 90s to launch a career in the music industry. Um, ended up working with some of the people I grew up listening to, like Snoop Dogg and um, Tupac's group. And later in the late 90s, founded my own record label and became an up and coming music producer. I uh, produced an entire album for Snoop Dogg, um, signed one of his artists, one of Tupac's artists, um, and did an album with the late barrier rap star Mac Dre. Um, I just signed a multi million dollar deal and I ended up catching a small, or at least seemingly small time marijuana charge that would later um, radically alter my life um, based on some, the actions of a federal prosecutor and um, local drug agents. Um, I was charged in a way that triggered a 55 year mandatory minimum for roughly $900 worth of cannabis. Um, that was a sentence that was so extreme that even the judge who was forced to impose it, um, actually stepped down in protest and called on the president to commute my sentence. Um, and that's, you know, sort of how I got involved in activism. So is that one of the reasons why you started the Weldon Project? Could you tell us a little bit about the Weldon Project? Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, I ended up serving 13 years of that 55 year sentence and it took that long to get me out. And I had a lot of support, you know, more support than most, you know, regular people have. I had, you know, folks in the entertainment industry, um, people like Alicia Keys, uh, Snoop Dogg, Bonnie Rayet, Mike Epps. And then I had uh, political uh, individuals trying to get me out, like Senator Cory Booker, Senator Mike Lee, Rand Paul, and even the Koch brothers. And so we had this unique, unlikely allies coalition that stepped up to really get me out. And, and I think, you know, it had more to do with my judge than myself, because my judge authored, he did something no federal judge had ever done in history. You know, he protested the sentence he was forced to impose, called on the president to pardon me as he was handing down the sentence. And that had never been done before. This judge was extremely conservative. He was a George W. Bush appointee. And I think that, you know, um, is part of the reason why there were so many people interested in my story. Um, and so this, this unique group of individuals that also included over 160 former DOJ officials, federal judges, um, and, you know, state um, government officials, and ultimately, you know, we lobbied President Obama to intervene in my case. Um, in 2016, I was released from federal prison after serving 13 years. And I started working on criminal justice reform. It was the tail end of Obama's administration. And so when Trump was elected, you know, we, we had basically thought that, you know, we were going to be out of work for four years. You know, we were going to be just finding something else to do. And surprisingly, you know, we were invited to the White House to work on a bill called the First Step Act. And we worked on that with, you know, people from both sides of the aisle. And that was passed in December of 2018. Um, after that was passed, that dealt with, I became the poster child for that deal. Um, you know, Cory Booker was bringing it up in the Senate. Um, and when that passed, it corrected a statute that allowed prosecutors and drug agents to seek and secure a mandatory 55-year sentence for a nonviolent low-level drug offense. So that statute was reformed. And, you know, that was one of my main goals coming out of prison. But, you know, my next mission was ending incarceration for marijuana offenses. And that's why I launched the Weldon Project. And our first initiative was Project Mission Green. Project Mission Green seeks to end, you know, all incarceration for, you know, nonviolent low-level cannabis offenses. And given that I just established a relationship with the White House, I shifted my attention to presidential clemency. Um, you know, for the next, you know, two years, we worked um, with the White House on getting individuals clemency who had cannabis related charges. And so, you know, we were successful. We've got we got a number of people out through that program on President Trump's last day. We re helped get out 12 people who were serving life uh, sentences for cannabis. Um, and, you know, we, we had a few other successes, you know, before that. But that was, you know, our biggest win in the single day. Um, in addition to the, the marijuana related, you know, cases, we also were able to get out Michael Harris, otherwise known as Harry O, who was the co-founder 
uh, the co-founder of uh, Death Row Records and, uh, and also uh, Loon from Bad Boy Records. So um, because of my background in hip hop, you know, there were a number of people in hip hop that reached out to me for help. And, you know, um, being so young when this happened, that lets, you know, us know that you're one of the great ones because sometimes in life, the great ones, we have to go through experiences because it takes our experience to fight that fight to make that difference for others. So I know it was overwhelming and really painful for you to, to have to go through that at such a young age. But unfortunately, that's what, you know, the great ones that the most high calls on to make a positive difference you know, in society and changing some of the laws and regulations and the rules that, you know, that we're unfortunately governed to live by. So, you know, I, you know, salute you for, you know, for taking on all of this being so young. How do you feel that it affected you, you know, with, you know, everything was like flourishing as in your music career and to have this happen how did that make you feel being so young with, with a sentence so overwhelmingly powerful for something that didn't warrant, you know, the sentence? Yeah, it was definitely, you know, a nightmare. You know, I did, like you just said, I was young. I think I was 22 at the time of the offense and 23 when I was charged. You know, I just launched, you know, a career that, you know, most people, you know, dream about. And so, I finally was able to get myself out of poverty. I grew up in poverty, you know, and I didn't want my sons. I had two young sons. I didn't want them to, you know, grow up in poverty either. And so that's why I really, you know, tried my hardest to get in the music industry. And, you know, given that I, you know, was able to obtain that, you know, it was a dream come true that was just shattered by prohibition, by, you know, the government's war on drugs. And so it was very devastating to, to know that that was destroyed over a little bit of cannabis. Uh, you know, it was definitely a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. So what would you tell um, middle school and high school students, you know, that, you know, feel that it's okay to sell marijuana or whatever? What would you share with them in regards to your experience? What would you say to them? Yeah, I definitely tell them not to take the chance. It's definitely not worth it. Um, it ended up destroying my entire life, you know, and it destroyed my family's life. I didn't even get a chance to see my father alive again. You know, he passed away a few months before I got out. Um, and so it's definitely not worth it. And if you feel something's unjust, I think the best way to do something about it is to, you know, fight for change. Um, you know, at, at that young age, you know, I was always, I always felt like the war on at least marijuana was ridiculous. You know, it was a part of our culture. You know, we, we, we smoked it when we were making music and it was just everywhere. It was harmless to us. And we thought, you know, there's no reason this should even be illegal. And, and so, you know, and, and but the fact that I sold it, I, you know, I took a risk. Unfortunately, the federal system is so unjust. I never knew the risk would be 55 years because there was people in my neighborhood, my own friends and homeboys that got went to prison for murder and got out in eight years, you know, five years, 10 years. And so, you know, there is a risk there and it's definitely not worth it, you know, and it's going to give you a felony on your conviction or on your record, a felony conviction. And that felony will prevent you from being successful. It's going to prevent you from getting loans, you know, moving into, you know, certain apartment complexes or, you know, getting a house and, and an automobile loan. So that felony can be a major roadblock. So it's definitely not worth it for sure. What would you say to that teenagers that still thinks that still glorifies, you know, prison life, because I still, you know, hear youth glorifying prison life and for individuals that did not, you know, were not, did not have to take that route, you know, they consider them a nerd or weak or what would you say to teens to encourage them that that's not a route that should be glorified? Yeah, prison is definitely not the spot. Tupac said it best. It's not it's not the place to be. It's nothing there's nothing cool about prison. You know, prison is dangerous, it's nasty, it's depressing, you know. Um I've watched people get stomped to death 
right there in front of correctional officers who sat there and turned turn their eye out to it because even the, the, the correctional officers play by the politics in there. And, and so, you know, I witnessed multiple people get murdered in there. Um, you know, I witnessed people go in there for a two year drug sentence and, and end up with a life sentence because of something that happened in prison. Um, you know, it's dangerous and, and it's definitely, it, it takes away your life. I have a, a 13 year gap in, in my memories where, you know, there's nothing there. There's no, you know, uh, uh, memories that, you know, of me and my kids and watching them grow up. It's just nothing but misery. And so pr- there's nothing cool about prison. Yeah, condolences um, in regards to your dad. I know that must was like really overwhelming. Did they allow you to at least go to his funeral? They did not. Um, I was considered a public safety risk just solely due to my time. I had 55 years, so they considered me a high security. So I went to a maximum security prison just because of my sentence. Whereas if I had been charged a different way for the same exact offense, I would have went to a camp for six months and went and I would have been home. And the camp don't even have prison walls or gates. You can walk off. It's, you know, it's almost like a halfway house. And so, um, you know, it, it, because I was such a high security, I wasn't allowed to have a furlough to go to my dad's funeral. So what can we do as the public to um, help your cause and help make a difference and change hard sentences yeah, well, I, I think everyone needs to speak out and educate educate the public and educate lawmakers, you know, on these these lengthy sentences, you know, despite who they were meant for, you know, high level cartel members and, and really dangerous people and they're being applied to low level drug offenders. I've seen so many individuals in there, mostly people of color who were in there for 20, 30, 40 years for, you know, a, a sugar packet worth of crack. And so, you know, the more we educate the public and and put pressure on, you know, on Congress to do something about it. So everyone needs to step up and help with that. But also on the flip side, we need to provide more resources for people coming out of prison because there's a lot of people coming out of prison. They don't have anyone to come out to help them reenter society successfully. And it's very important that individuals get out and they have somebody to walk them through the steps of re-entering society, such as getting their driver's license, you know, um, helping them get a job, preparing for a job interview. You know, there's a number of things, especially getting an education, which, you know, we're trying to get, make sure people can get a college education in prison because I was luckily at a prison that had a college program. And so we had professors coming to the prison and I took advantage of that, got my degree. And, you know, that helped me tremendously. That's a real education. Prison courses that they teach all across the country, by, you know, other fellow prisoners doesn't do anything for, you know, it's just something to pass time. But college is a real education that you can actually take with you when you get out and you can actually get a better job. And so, you know, it's very important that we, you know, help individuals reenter, you know, we, we, we provide the resources and, and make sure that they have a successful second chance. Yes, um, speaking of second chances, how has the music industry embraced you since you came out? Yeah, it's been amazing, actually. Um, you know, when I got out, you know, I f- met up with Snoop Dogg. We went and did a, a, a panel at South by Southwest to really talk about, you know, what happened to me and, and really tell the story out there. And, and, and uh, surprisingly, you know, a number of people, other people who are in hip hop like myself, um, because at least in I know in the early 2000s, there was a big movement. Um, to prosecute people in hip hop. And it's just a fact. And so when I got out, there was other people that were still feeling the impacts of the, you know, the earlier war on drugs that needed my help, or, you know, they had a family member. And, you know, that's how we end up helping the co-founder of Death Row Records, uh, Loon from Bad Boy. And, you know, I'm currently working on Ty Dollar Sign's brother to get him out of prison. And so, you know, the hip hop community, you know, definitely embraced me and they're supporting what I'm doing you know, we are working on a clemency program with the Biden administration, and we have support from Drake, Killer Mike, you know, Meek Mill, and, and, you know, Ty Dolla Sign, Tory Lanez, and all the people in hip hop right now are rallying around, you know, this call to end the hypocrisy of keeping, you know, mostly people of color incarcerated for marijuana while allowing predominantly older white men to profit from doing the same thing. Wow, it sounds like your experience has brought you to your purpose in life, your greatness in life. You know, sometimes we feel and sometimes we think that we have this 
um, route to go to as far as our purpose. But then the most high has a greater purpose for us, you know, a higher cause. And I know it's painful for us to have to endure, you know, a lot of the hardships, but because you endured so much, you're going to, your experience is going to encourage others that are in your situation to have hope. Because if someone doesn't go through anything, it's like people that have been through the struggle, they can't relate. But when you've gone through as much as you've gone through, you're going to be strengthening a lot of men and women around the globe. And you're going to let them, your experience is going to let them know that, hey, you know, you know, this is not the end of the road for me, you know, there is help out here. There are people that want to change the laws that are really, you know, it's like, how did this happen? Oh. It's like, you know, you're, we're, it's like it was happening while we were awake, but unknowingly underground behind the scenes for them to make the laws so harsh. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I really think that, you know, this did happen for a reason. Um, somebody has to experience it for themselves to really know how messed up the system is. And it, you know, I never knew this was going on because, you know, most of the uh, uh, the people around me were going in the state system and the state system is, you know, more reasonable. The federal system is completely out of whack. And so, you know, I, and, and I actually had the opportunity to go on a panel with my prosecutor, the man who actually sent me away for 55 years. And one of the things that was asked what was, you know, if I could go back in time, would I have re- you know, what I have not gotten in trouble or what I've taken the prosecutor's plea offer because they offered me a plea of 15 years, which was even, it was still unjust. You know, you can't justify 15 years for $900 worth of marijuana. And so, and, I, and my answer was no to both of them. No, I wouldn't have accepted the plea offer because had I accepted the plea offer, I would have went to prison and just remained a statistic. No one would have been like, okay, this system's jacked. You know, but getting a 55 year sentence opened a lot of people's eyes. Um, and so, you know, my judge who was tough on crime before that, he, you know, he was a, a supporter of ending Miranda rights. You know, he was a really tough on crime conservative judge. And so, you know, going through what I went through opened up the eyes of a lot of conservatives because of what my judge, you know, felt uh, how he felt about the sentence. And, and the other thing I said no to was, you know, would I have, you know, done everything differently. And the same, same answer was no, because, you know, even though I had a career that was, you know, I had a multi-million dollar deal, um, you know, but I feel like, you know, this actually brought meaning to my life. You know, I could have been a successful music producer and maybe, you know, went on to do something else and that was it. But this has given me the opportunity to, to make lasting change and to make history. You know, the, the first step back that, you know, was changed in part because of my case, you know, wouldn't have happened, you know, were it not for what happened to me. And so because of the First Step Act, 16,000 people have been released early. And some of those individuals' lives were saved because they were released early as a result of the COVID pandemic. And they would not have had, the, the judge would not have had the power to re release them had it not been for the First Step Act. So, you know, a part of me said, you know, I would do the same thing just for all the good that came out of all the suffering that, that me and my family went through. Did the prosecutor that was on the panel, did he have any remorse for the unjust sentence? He did. So, um, and, and, and he had told this to me before the panel, because I had actually, you know, met him when I got out and he actually apologized. Um, he um, basically, you know, he made an excuse that, you know, uh, you know, there was a very tough on crime administration. You know, George W. Bush was, you know, tough on drug drug cases. The attorney general was his boss at the U.S. attorney's office was very tough. But he said for a lot of the choices that he made that contributed to my 55 year sentence, that he apologized. And so and, and he ended up being a supporter of my release, you know, uh, at the very last minute, um, you know, and even though, you know, it's very it's a little too late, you know, for him to say, you know, I'm sorry when he could have done something when he was in power. Uh, but he now looks at the system differently because now he just became a judge. And now he has the experience of having, you know, oppressed somebody, you know, he oppressed me and probably a lot of other people. And so I think he, you know, he came to the, the realization that it was wrong. And so I, I feel like, you know, now a, as a judge that he's going to, you know, exercise discretion, you know, much more cautiously. 
Yes, we at Encoda Management Real Talk with Encoda applaud you for fighting for justice and looking out for our future because the things that you're working on with, you know, your team and the Weldon pro Project is going to help make a brighter future for young individuals as well as older individuals that are being handed unjust sentences for, you know, the situations that they, you know, are in or that was put in. So I really honor you and you're really respected over here. I'm just so proud of you, you know, like a mama bear. It's like, Thank you. You're, you know, there's so many people and most people in around the globe either know or have someone within the criminal justice system that has an unjust term. And to see, you know, that we have someone great like you that did not just sometimes people when things are handed unjust, they want to give up and run away. And it's like other people's problem is not their problem. So that's why, you know, I'm saying that you're one of the great ones because you didn't just like, okay, I'm out, I'm done. It's not my problem. It's like, you was like, okay, I have to make sure that this does not happen to anyone else. So that makes you one of the great ones and stay encouraged. And sometimes it might even still get a little harder, but just stay encouraged and know that you are definitely making a great difference and people are watching you. You know, you have people that are in prison now and you're giving them hope because sometimes things like this can make people suicidal and depressed and absolutely have PTSD and people don't know how, you know, when you're taken away from your loved ones, family, friends, and whatnot, how it affects you mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Speaking of spiritually, have you, did, were you able to gain any spiritual connections due because of this situation? Yeah, absolutely. Outside. You know, suffering definitely, you know, brings that out. Um, and, and, you know, I was suffering before my incarceration. And so, yeah, definitely, um, it, I did have that effect. So do you have any last words that you would like to share with our global audience? You know, anything inspiring, motivational? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, um, you know, there, there's nothing we can't do if we stick together. Um, look at my situation. It was a very unlikely situation. You know, I had people from very opposing uh, views coming together who would never have worked together on anything else to come and fight for one person um, to give me the tools so I could be the voice for the other people that I left behind. And so, you know, we've, we've accomplished some amazing, um, you know, accomplishments. And so there's nothing we can't do if we do it together. Um, and, and we, we encourage anyone who's interested in helping us to join us, you know, go to the weldonproject.org, sign up for a volunteer, you know, donate, share our stories or follow us on Instagram at, at project mission green or at the Weldon project. We need all the help we can get. Yes, and thank everyone for joining us on Real Talk with Encoda. We thank you, Weldon Angelo, 